Hello, I'm Greg Gutfeld with Kimberly Kilfoyle, Juan Williams, Jesse Waters, and she sunbathes on a waffle. Dana Perino, The Five. <laughs> to summarize the Golden Globes, women wore black, men wore pins. People used words like intersectional gender parity. We want um, intersectional gender parity. Oh my. Mm, yes, nothing like messing on the carpet. <laughs> the script was set. A show of unity condemning abuses most in Hollywood had ignored for decades. It's about time. I don't think I could take another standing ovation for a child rapist. Oh but when everyone gets the memo, it makes the memo less powerful. One form of lockstep becomes another. But Hollywood's therapy is always projection, lecturing us on us when what's really wrong is Hollywood. For example, Connie Britton's shirt that reads, Poverty is sexist. Well, it's true, at least 60% of our homeless are men. Now, I'm not sure that's what she meant, but my point is this. It makes no sense to inject identity politics into shared suffering. Unless, of course, it looks good on a shirt. The Handmaid's Tale, one, it was a horror fantasy where women are routinely abused. Keep the Handmaid's Tale from becoming real, says the guy who won. Sadly, he wasn't referring to Iran. I think he meant us. Because Hollywood tends to miss the real abuses. Iran, Venezuela, the USSR, Cuba. They're always the last to know or care. Then came Oprah, a planned, strong speech designed to bring moral clarity to an immoral terrain. For too long, women have not been heard or believed if they dared to speak their truth to the power of those men. But their time is up. So I want all the girls watching here and now to know that a new day is on the horizon. Hmm. It went on. The Time's Up button didn't apply to her. But it was genius for having Oprah on made the night about her and not the scandals. Even NBC called her the next president. That sounds familiar. <laughs> How about Elizabeth Biden and Oprah? Warren's going anywhere. I like oh, her. that's a ticket. Nominate Oprah, she wins. <laughs> no, I'm not kidding. It's just like, just skip it all, get to the point, put Oprah <laughs> up there, she wins. You don't, even have, you don't even hold the election, it's over. Oprah's an icon who, unlike traditional politicians, could match a wild card like Donald Trump. And if she won, she could give everyone a free car. 2020 won Oprah versus Donald, best, greatest election ever, correct? Oprah... Franken. And That's a good. woman ran for president of the United States, and if she wasn't such a bad candidate, she, maybe she would have won. Exactly. Condoleezza Rice would have done better. Oh, should have been Oprah. <laughs> Seriously, President Oprah is the best idea Hollywood has. Well, it may be the only one they have left. <laughs> I watched Kimberly yes. the entire uh, show. The world knows. Uh, you know, I thought that it was brilliant that Oprah came on because it overshadowed a lot of the negativity and people came away with a good feeling. Whether you disagreed with it or not, it was, it was, people are talking about that. Right, right, right. Well, look, I mean, that was probably the big pivotal moment of the night. You saw it uh, across social media and all the blogs. People loved it. Um, she looked great. She sounded fantastic, confident, poised. Um, certain of her message, and it was extremely well received by uh, achieving gender parity <laughs> for men and women. So once again, uh, Miss O is winning. Mm -hmm. You know, so Dana, when I think about this, I think that this could be the mirror of Trump in the sense that if there's a crowded Democratic field in 2019, she, if she's up on stage with like 17 other politicians, she instantly vaults to the front yep. because she's not a politician. She's a billionaire, and she and and she's like a hardcore persuader, like Trump, and a businesswoman. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so. I think the thing is that she doesn't want to run for president. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, people keep asking her. I, I suppose that a couple of her friends said, that, well, she's really considering it. But I, I guess now that we've broken the seal on taking a, a different approach to mm -hmm. politics, I think that she would be as good a candidate as anyone else. It would be interesting, though, to see how the Democrats who support Bernie Sanders would react to uh, an Oprah presidency. Mm -hmm. I don't think the Bernie bros are going to be very happy. What do you think? Oh, well, welcome back, Juan, by the way. Thanks, man. Yeah. You, how was Jamaica? Excellent. Yeah, yeah, I had a good time. <laughs> you missed some great weather, I'll have you say. Well, I missed you guys. Oh, that's great. Oh, don't lie, Juan. Um, ah, is that true? The Dems would be he crazy not three. to recruit her, right? 
You know, I, I don't get it. I mean, you know, Dana says we've broken the seal on this, so we're, now it's like the biggest celebrity becomes the president. Why do you no, hate I seals? No, I just said that it's not. It wouldn't <laughs> be out of the. It wouldn't be. She wouldn't be the first. No, absolutely not. But I think you know. So Stedman Graham, her longtime uh, friend, has said, yeah, she'd absolutely do it. Um, but when she was interviewed some time back by David Rubenstein, mm -hmm. uh, Rubenstein asked her, and she said, well, I just thought that was ridiculous because I know nothing about politics. I know nothing about foreign affairs, blah, blah, blah. But now, with Donald Trump, she said, uh, mm. I thought, well, maybe. So maybe the door is open. But for me, I just, I just don't understand what's the attraction of people who don't know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, she, she's a terrific <laughs> personality. I, mean, like, I happen to know Obama. her. I happen to know her and like her very much. I just don't know if she'd be president of the United States. Of course, I don't think the same thing about someone we know well. Yeah, how hard <laughs> could it be, Jesse? Running a business is harder than running the country, right? Uh, uh sure. <laughs> <laughs> I just like how self-satisfied you looked when you were playing the clips of yourself predicting. <laughs> Can we see that look again on your yes. face? Yes, that was the I was yeah, right. Moment. Yes, yes. Um, also, knock off the stuff about Connie Britton. I like Connie Britton. What is she? It was a fine shirt. I like her in Nashville, so just lay off her. All right, all right. She got killed in Nashville. She don't ruin it. Um, <laughs> that was I like three seen, seasons ago. Not that far yet, Dana. That is a spoiler. <laughs> Listen, I want the people to pick the president. I don't want the press to pick it. I think the draft Oprah movement shows how desperate the Democrats are and how weak their bench is. But to be honest, she is a threat. I mean, she's a self-made. Billionaire, she is incredibly captivating, mm -hmm. as as you said, Public Kimberly. Speaker, yeah. She has wide appeal as a black woman to middle America. She can sell finance, but I do wonder about, you know, what's her position on North Korea? <laughs> Does o President Oprah strike fear in the hearts of ISIS? What does she think about the border policy? But wait, I think wait, a little wait. This bit. sounds like you're talking about Trump a Listen, year ago. Trump was an international business tycoon who'd been dabbling in politics and policy for decades. One. Really? Yeah. Oh, okay. national he'd be giving policy. Speeches he like about oh. it. Yeah. He'd been writing about it. Oh, yeah. I I, Oprah's more of a vessel, and even oh. you would have to admit she's a vessel. <laughs> Come on. I, I, as I said earlier, I don't think she knows much about politics or foreign affairs, but you. I don't get how you can say Trump knew everything. I think Trump knows a lot more about politics oh, and policy I than see. Oprah. Wow. Well, okay. But do you know what? Uh, speaking of business, Weight Watchers shares jumped 13 percent, Kimberly, <laughs> because she owns 10 percent. Okay. Well, good. <laughs> I mean, I think Weight Watchers helps a lot of people. It does. Don't you? I'm, ho well, I'm hoping it, it might help me. Be Just fit. by mentioning them, I might get a free box of food. Live, is that what you're trying to do? Yes. Is if I mention Weight Watchers. Sponsorship. Yes, yes. They deliver the food, don't they? Uh, what was that again? Weight Watchers. Got it. Yes, yes. I've had a whole thing today about how men are now becoming the spokesperson for um, companies like Weight Watchers. Yeah. And like including Nutris. Rob Lowe for the Atkins diet. Uh. And like Nutrisystem and things like that. I think it just like sitting up a little bit better might also help. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Going after my posture. What did you, you want, you. Dana knows I have great posture. Unlike. Remember? These other malcontents. You watched the whole thing. <laughs> yes. So what was your. I responded positively in the affirmative to an email from the producers. Yeah. What did, how did you feel of the tone overall from the Golden Globes? Do you, you think what? there was, it was restrained and yeah. humble? Yes, but I think everybody, like the women dressed in black, it seemed a little bit more like somber, a little bit more, you yeah. know, not as I guess like ebullient and people being really like raucous. It was just more kind of, I guess, dignified. I didn't mind it as much. I thought I wasn't going to like it, but it wasn't bad for me. Like I, I liked the Oprah thing. I thought all the women looked really um, beautiful. I loved all the black dresses. At first, I thought it was going to be some kind of like aggressive you know, movement, but mm -hmm. it wasn't. It was just dignified. So I think it was fine. I, I didn't have a problem with it. It was entertained. I kept it on. The only, the weird thing too is that they had they invited T Tanya Harding mm -hmm. there, and because uh, there was a sh that they made a movie about her, she was there, and um, they kind of portrayed her as a feminist icon. But allegedly, didn't she plan to attack? Wasn't she part of the attack? One. Yeah, she, in fact, she. I mean, Nancy Kerrigan one. was a victim. Yeah, <laughs> yeah she, Nancy Kerrigan was kneecapped by someone that was trying to help her out. Yeah, yeah, That's yeah, yeah. She admitted she knew about it. I think, yeah, she's like a like a reluctant accomplice. Yeah. You know what strikes me though is that the culture. Good now, strikes. The culture is a, is ahead of the politics in America. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, everything is about the culture. Everything is about the Golden Globes, Oprah. Mm -hmm. You don't need to really know anything to run for office. I'm like, what? The world has gone crazy. Or the world has just gotten more awesome. You know, um, I'm going to play a, a sound on tape of the host, Seth Meyers, who nobody remembers because of Oprah. This is what he, you know how we always talk about Hollywood or a bunch of elites? He addresses that criticism. Mm. 
This looks like a room of privileged Hollywood elite, and that's fair. But everyone in this room knows that Hollywood is so much more than that. When you're on a film set, you meet hairdressers and camera people and script supervisors. Most of the jobs on film sets are jobs for people who work long, hard hours. They are American dream jobs. Those people aren't there thanks to their rich dad, except for that one PA. People in this room worked really hard to get here, but it's clearer now than ever before that the women had to work even harder. So, Jesse, what he's doing is he's taking the little people, yes. the little people to make it so that the big the elites don't look so bad. Like, look, we, we have hairstylists, That's and right. we have makeup, and we have caterers. My butler, and my, my, my driver. <laughs> my footman. Water's That's right. world. <laughs> That's right. I know. Who was the woman, I think, it was on The View or one of those shows? She goes, you know, we need open borders because someone's got to clean the bathrooms. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's what it comes off as. And, and then, so NBC comes out and then promotes oh, th this whole presidency of, of Oprah. Yeah. But I, because she did a Me Too speech, but then NBC also covered up for Matt Lauer mm -hmm. and then spiked the wine scene exclusive. Mm -hmm. So I don't really know what NBC wants. I mean, you can't have it both ways. Yeah, and you know, Dana, I forgot about that, that NBC actually tweeted that Oprah was going to be the next president. Right. Yeah. Then they pulled the tweet. A third well, this party. This is what I think was interesting. So yeah, they, uh, what NBC said is that they the had meat. outsourced Twitter that night to a third party who had tweeted that, so that's why they deleted it. But I thought, I know how Twitter works. It's not that hard, and yeah. you do not have to hire a third party to do it. No, no, no. Just have a party. Just do a party. Yeah, just like have you a party. You had one last night. Yes, I had. I, my tweets were remarkably mild, <laughs> I believe. You didn't get well anything received. from media relations? No, I got, they were well received. Well received. But they were across well, the board. Across the board were well received. <laughs> 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 All right, that's enough. I don't think we'll be speaking about the Golden Globes, at least for another year. You'll be talking about Oprah, though. Yeah, you know it. Mm -hmm. All right, we turn to Oprah's. 2020 opponent ahead, President Trump's staunch defense of his mental fitness. That's next. I love it. Somebody called a psychiatrist. There was a crazy panic over the weekend <laughs> after the president's critics poured through fire and fury. Oh, wait. They're all psychiatrists now. We could look back a year from now and say the warning signs were there and we did not do enough. We're in a real constitutional crisis. The leadership of the country in Congress, privately and in public, openly questioned the fitness and stability of the President of the United States. When you hear him put out that tweet, stable genius, it's kind of like Richard Nixon, I'm not a crook. Even a Democrat who supported Hillary Clinton suggests everybody settle down. Yep. It's very dangerous, you know. There's only one thing worse than trying to criminalize political differences, and that's trying to psychiatrize them. These psychiatrists now who are trying to diagnose without ever having met the man, that's what they did in Russia. I represented dissidents who they locked up in mental hospitals. That's what they did in China. That's what they did in apartheid South Africa. How dare liberals, people on the left, try to undo democracy by accusing a president of being mentally ill without any basis. President Trump didn't have to, but he did address the mental health concerns from his critics in a tweet calling himself a, quote, very stable genius, <laughs> and then appeared before cameras at Camp David. I went to uh, the best colleges for college. Uh, I went to a, uh, I had a situation where I was a very excellent student, came out, made billions and billions of dollars, became one of the top business people, went to television and for 10 years was a tremendous success, as you probably have heard, uh, ran for president one time and won. And then I hear this guy that uh, does it not know me, doesn't know me at all. This is the same thing they do with Reagan and they did with Bush, that all Republican presidents are dumb and crazy. And now they're doing it with or President one or the Trump. Other. Right. I, this to, I went way over the line to me. The, the psychiatrists all getting together and having like a secret cabal to figure out, you know, they, first they thought he didn't really want to run and then that he didn't really want to win and that he didn't really want to govern. And then today his deputy press secretary announces that he is for sure running again in 2020. And so... I think this is a big, one, waste of time by the Democrats because they're ceding all of the policy ground to, to Republicans as they 
tick off their agenda one by one, and the economy is fully recovered, and President Trump pushing uh, the, down the gas pedal on that with the tax cuts. And so you're left with the Democrats trying to hang their hat on their hopes on some sort of mental instability uh, claim, which is really unfortunate. One, I think it's preposterous, but also I would say this. I think it's really unfortunate for this country who has talked about mental health a lot for the, in the last several years mm -hmm. and how we need to do more to address it. And they're basically making a mockery of it. And there are a lot of people out there that, that are dealing with mental health issues or, or whose children are or whose family members are. And this is super irresponsible. Do you agree with Dana's point that they've, they've failed to defeat President Trump in the arena of ideas, so they're throwing the smear at him? This is, um, okay, calling him Hitler, that didn't work. Nope. nope. <laughs> the Russia thing is stalling. So this is like in their tool shed. This is the this is now the chainsaw because all the rifles are empty. So they're got to come out with this. None of the people calling him crazy could have pulled off what he did. And the thing is, when you if you are let's say you're you're clinically mentally ill, you're consistent, consistently clinically mentally ill. You can't go out and do a rally and then a speech and then all of a sudden go back privately and dissolve into some kind of. I don't know, gibbering like mess. That doesn't, that's not how it works. That's what they're suggesting. They're suggesting that when you see him, he's fine, but then behind closed doors, he just loses it. I have questions about the psychiatrist. I've looked up on this stuff. There's some interesting things about her that I think warrant further explanation. But in defense of people using this, and I think Juan might agree with me on this, this is the mirror image of the birth certificate. Ooh. The 25th Amendment argument. And the birth certificate argument are both identically the same in terms of delegitimizing the person. So everybody, everything has a mirror here. When you, when, the, when we're saying this is insane, a lot of people were saying the same thing about the birth certificate. Right. Even though there might be a little bit more legitimacy to the birth certificate because we didn't have the, we didn't have the real thing. But I think they're kind of similar. I will say this, Donald Trump. You can say that he's odd. People who do extraordinary things are often odd. But they're not crazy. They might be a little bit off, you know, a little nutty, Kimberly. Greg. <laughs> yes. Man in the mirror. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll let. I'll let you love it. That's I'll, a great point. Let's let Juan respond yeah. because uh, is this an attempt to delegitimize the president? No. It's what, what struck me was that, the, you know, largely this comes out of the Michael Wolf book, right? And who is Wolf quoting? He's quoting Republicans. I mean, you don't have to go on the over, record. Yeah, I mean, look, which Rand, on the Rand, record, Rand, Rand, Paul, Rand Paul before that said this guy is a delusional narcissist. I think Lindsey Graham, who this weekend came out and said oh, everything's fine, Lindsey Graham said he's a kook, he, a kook, right? Bob Corker, the Republican senator, has said basically this is adult daycare. This man has never demonstrated either the capacity president or the stability necessary. But they're talking about a personality. They're, they're right. judging a personality. That's right. They're not talking about the well, actual mental state. No, That's right. way different. No, no, no. I think this is the same, Greg. I think they're talking about the guy they deal with that they think is a little off and that they're reluctant to say it and they don't attack him, but they apparently said this stuff to Wolf, if he's to be believed. Well, Bob and Parker. then once Wolf puts that it out there, then everybody says, wait a second. Is this the, you know, the king has no clothes and nobody's willing to say it, especially among Republicans? But the, psychi but the psychiatrists getting together for their cabal was separate and that's apart. That's a separate apart. That's, that's, that's what's driving it. That's why I, no, no, no. What drives it, I think, is the book and all the revelations that Republicans are saying these things about well, Trump. Well, and I'll pose this to Kimberly. You know what I think is crazy? What? When people say that global warming is a greater threat than ISIS. That, I think, is mentally insane. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, well, that's definitely disturbed. But, you know, I like what Alan uh, Dershowitz has to say. Politically oppose someone. Don't sit there and try to cast dispersions about their mental state or faculties or ability to serve. I mean, okay, if he's crazy, then crazy is good. Uh, sign me up for more because he's had tremendous amount of accomplishments. Everybody pretty much with a sane mind has had to admit that in terms of what he's been able to achieve and get done in a very quick period of time. But this is something that disturbs Disturbs people. They find it mentally disturbing that he's done as well as he has. So they're trying to now go back on him and cast these types of ideas on people to try to make it more mainstream and acceptable. This is a guy who doesn't have his faculties or lacks intelligence. Really? 
So how did he get into the White House? Yeah, he defeated a dynasty. I mean, to be honest, you know, and 16 very qualified, you know, candidates that ran. He did all the debates. He campaigned out there. He made a tremendous amount of uh, money and jobs and created in terms of the economy with American businesses. So was this all just, you know, dumb luck? I think people are just sick of all this winning, Kimberly. That's what it That's is. That's what it is. <laughs> I'm sure. All right, ahead, Steve Bannon attempts to make amends after turning on the president. But did he close the book for good on his own political career? Up next. They say it's never too late to say sorry. But in Steve Bannon's case, it may be. The former chief White House strategist appears to have done himself in with the president over disparaging remarks that turned up in the new book, Fire and Fury. He's now attempting to backtrack, but will it get him back in the good graces of the man who's dubbed him Sloppy Steve? In a statement, a regretful Bannon says Donald Trump Jr. is both a patriot and a good man. My support is also unwavering for the president and his agenda. My comments were aimed at Paul Manafort. He should have known the Russians are duplicitous, cunning, and not our friends. I regret that my delay in responding to the inaccurate Accurate reporting regarding Don Jr. has diverted attention from the president's historical accomplishments in the first years of his presidency. Okay. Hmm. Is sorry good enough? You know, you know what it reminds me? Bannon is like your best friend telling you a drunken, disgusting story and then notices that your wife's in the other room and heard everything. <laughs> so, no, that, so that's the script I'm writing for the movie that I want to make. It never really happened. It's too late. There's, he's, he's like, he wanted to burn the, hat, the world down and now he has no matches and he has no lighter fluid. He has only one path, dancing with the stars. Oh, no! And Hillary as his partner. <laughs> TV mind right here. You can't do that. You have to have a professional as your partner. Oh, but think of the, but just nice think concept. how beautiful. But they could, they could think how beautiful it would be. I just feel. <laughs> All right. Shake it off, shake it off. Okay, Dana, what do you, what do you make of this? Uh, do you like, first of all, in terms of the communications, do you like um, the message? And was it uh, too little too late? I, it doesn't really matter what I think. I would just say that uh, hours after the book had hit the ground and this guy is, is a he's obviously very smart he knows communications pretty well and he waited and waited because I think he actually did say it and now he's trying to figure out a way to sort of backtrack um, one thing he didn't backtrack was the comments that he made about Mueller's investigation actually zeroing in on money laundering mm -hmm. and Jared Kushner mm -hmm. that wasn't a part of the statement that he released on Sunday and then the other thing is I noticed um, in chapter 7 of the book there's this little detail and it doesn't necessarily have to do with Bannon, but it is a, when Michael Flynn does an interview with Karen DeYoung of the Washington Post. It's on background. And she asks him, um, did you have contact with the Russians in which you discussed sanctions? And he says no, and he denies it twice. She calls back to the communications director, Michael Anton, and said, hey, uh, Michael Flynn, he just denied this twice. Uh, it was on background, but is it cool if we put that on the record since he denies it? Right. And Anton says, yeah, that's cool. Fine, no problem. Then he calls Michael Flynn and says, hey, by the way, I just want to let you know, I told them that they could use that on the record. Is that okay? And he gets a, oh, actually, uh, uh. <laughs> And now they can't pull it back. And it was a very interesting detail in the book that I thought, that's the moment that it all starts to unravel. That it starts to unravel. Okay, and also notice, um, Jesse, that he didn't say, I'm sorry, or regrets, or anything about Jared, or Ivanka, or anything like that. Uh, it was mostly about Don Jr., I think, was the apology, right. non-apology. Um, but the book itself was designed kind of as a hand grenade to throw inside the Trump White House, but the only person it really killed was Bannon. Uh, I, I think Trump survives this. Obviously, this guy came in uh, as a wolf in sheep's closing. He kind of punked his people in order to get in there, and then he tried to take down the White House. That was the guy's motivation, to take down Trump and actually you lead Michael Wolf. to impeachment. Correct. And so how can you trust anything, he says. The main point of the book was that Trump didn't want to win. So then, if he didn't want to win, why did he collude with the Russians to win? The whole thing doesn't make sense, especially saying that all of the Trump family thought their father was a loser and insane and not a yeah. good guy. It just It's so no erroneous. And so... CNN comes out, your hall monitor friend, mm -hmm. and says the book is riddled with inaccuracies, sloppy and shotting reporting, but it rings true. And that was their standard. 
Rings truth. true like, well, is the standard the at CNN. Is... I mean, that's fake yeah. news. That's why they get into so much trouble and have to fire people. If a conservative author kind of finagled his way into the Obama White House and wrote an error-filled book that took down or attempted to take down Obama, do you think that he'd be on every single show on TV and people would be giving him the benefit of the doubt and the media would say, oh, well, it rings true. No, well, he wouldn't be invited anywhere. Oh, yeah? His book would probably be boycotted, and he'd be totally trashed in the media. Oh, gee, we've never seen anything like that with the Clintons. I, oh, gee, what was the name of that book? That went Which one? Oh, the Dick yeah. Morris book? No, 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 uh, Peter Schweitzer's book? Well, right? Peter Schweitzer, oh, I think he got oh, any inside access. Oh, oh. It's well, the other, the no, point. no, 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 that's that's the that was very Ed Klein. Well sourced Ed Klein's books, right? Ed Klein's book. Yeah. All right. Right. But the point here, to your re rebuttal, which I thought was pretty good, but I must say, pretty who good. invited Wolf in? I agree. They invited oh, a wolf oh, in with sheep's Okay, clothing. but I'm saying they invited him in. Yeah, big self-inflicted error. I, right, big time. Big time. But, but that's their actions. They brought him in. And, it, and similarly, does anybody really think Bannon is was not part of Trump? Trump didn't love Bannon. Bannon loved Trump. They served each other's purposes. They had a nice relationship okay, for a while. So, so I'm saying this guy comes out and he says what he says. He does not retract it. And Kimberly, I think you're right. He didn't apologize. He didn't say, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. He didn't say anything like that. So to my I think it just would have been better if he had come out right away, like Dana said, and you know said something. That yeah, was but he didn't do that because apparently well, right. he, so that's, that's why what he said. Having a hard time so with in, not a sense, an apology. in a sense, and the president that rejected it. What Wolf wrote, right? So all of a sudden we say, hmm. So apparently Wolf did some interviews here, and apparently people aren't running away from it. I'll say but, one thing: Steve Bannon is very quotable. You he got it. some pretty <laughs> funny stuff. He's he sure really has. But I think the the bigger story here is that now that Bannon. The question is, does Ban is Bannon out at Breitbart? And that's still up in the air. Secondly, what about Rebecca Mercer and her dad? Because they're the big conservative money people who've been backing Bannon all along. But they, that's, so that broke they up said, a while ago. No, no, but they said last week that they're done now supporting Bannon. But what does that mean for Breitbart, for Bannon? And what does it mean for Mitch McConnell? Because all of a sudden, it looks like all the Senate incumbents that Bannon planned to attack won't be but, the, but I think more importantly that is that President Trump himself said at Camp David yeah. that he does not plan that, to that's why support the question any came insurgents. Up. And he's, mm -hmm. If he's going to be campaigning hard, it will be for the incumbent. Oh, so, so I do think Mitch McConnell will help Trump. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's I mean, what like, I think. The, bu the book has been widely criticized <laughs> because of so many inaccuracies. So many people say that they didn't say this. This didn't happen that way. I mean, you know, many it's people present for that. And <laughs> I don't know what what was going on with this guy. No distractions for the president as he continues to focus on a thriving economy and bringing jobs back to America. President Trump in Nashville. That's next. <laughs> A short while ago, President Trump laid out his plan to help rural America. Today, in the great state of Tennessee, he's the first president in a quarter century to address the American Farm Bureau Federation's annual convention. Here were some of the highlights. We have been working every day to deliver for America's farmers, just as they work every single day to deliver for us. The American dream is roaring back to life, and we have just signed into law the most significant tax cuts and reforms in American history. We're also putting an end to the regulatory assault on your way of life. We are witnessing a new era of patriotism, prosperity, and pride. And at the forefront of this exciting new chapter is the great American farmer. Farm country is God's country. So true. So, Juan, one of the things the president did at the very end is he signed an executive order authorizing more broadband connectivity issues, so like putting towers around so that um, people living in rural America could have the same type of uh, access that everybody else does. So I thought that was a pretty positive thing. What about you? Yeah, it is. I mean, I don't know, with net neutrality, they might have to pay a little more, but I think it's a great thing. In fact, I think a lot of the cable companies have been very aggressive about saying that is something that we can do, we should do. And so I think the support from the president is a big aid for that, and it's a big boon to rural America, which has been going through some very difficult economic times. Now, where the president and the farmers are on different pages when it comes to trade, Dana, because yeah. on issues like NAFTA and especially import-export, American farmers need that global marketplace. So he didn't say that he was going to change that. Liz Cheney was on the Daily Briefing today, Kimberly, mm -hmm. and she said that the 
agricultural community had had um, really good meetings with the White House and that she thinks that their concerns about NAFTA have actually been addressed. Yeah, this is what I thought was fascinating because, of, and persuasive, she seemed to have the information about it to say that this is something that's been discussed and now that they feel a sense of confidence. And I think this really goes to the sense that uh, President Trump uh, being very hands-on to try to address people's concerns, really understanding jobs and promising to, to connect with the working class men and women, including, yes, farmers, that farmers haven't been left behind Behind, just like coal miners haven't been left behind. So what are your particular interests and concerns of your core group, right? So as it relates to them, then they're able to meet, address those issues, and then move forward. I, I think it's effective governing is what it is, and it's what's been needed because no two groups kind of are the same. They have different needs, different concerns, and so you have to be sensitive to those and really actually listen to them, and he yeah. did that when he was campaigning, and now he's doing it while he's in the Oval. One of the things he led with, Greg, was something I know that you uh, talk about often, and that is um, basically doing the what the tax reform bill did on death taxes mm -hmm. so that people with family farms can try to keep it in the family more mm -hmm. and not be penalized. Yeah, he made a funny joke out of it. What did he say? He goes, this isn't really going to help you. But <laughs> <laughs> your you, children. Yeah, yeah, because <laughs> they'll be dead. But no, that's his important thing. Why You can't tax something that's already been taxed. That's actually immoral. It's wrong. It's theft. But I think I can speak for everybody that watches MSNBC and CNN. What's rural? <laughs> What's a farm? What's a farm? Back What's heartland? Huh? What is that? What? He had what? a very receptive crowd, Jesse. It's amazing that a billionaire real estate developer from, from Queens yeah. can bond so much with these farmers, and he has. And it's amazing the, the rural support that it the president face. has had. Um, and, and these are critical um, districts in, in an Ohio, in a Wisconsin, yes. in um in, in, in Iowa, and, and he's going to need these voters, and his ratings are slipping just marginally, but he comes out and he, he tends to these voters, not necessarily with any tools, but he talks about cutting the estate tax, he's selling his tax reduction plan, he's talking about broadband, and he's talking about slashing these regulations. He brought up the famous stream regulation, where if a little trickle of a stream runs through your property, all of a sudden the feds can regulate it. You know what it's called? What's it called? WOTUS. WOTUS. Waters of the United United States. Right. Like, this is the bill named after you. There yeah. you go. If you were president, you would be WOTUS. <laughs> <laughs> that will never happen. You go. never hear that. I got the show. All right. Some is. of you have told Shaking us in you your watch chair, the five while running on a treadmill, but you won't be able to anymore if you work out at one of national a national gin chain that's banned all cable news. Next. but I'm taking you uptown tonight. Work, 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 work. work. Exercise, that's one way to keep healthy in the new year. But one gym chain is also suggesting that you cut out cable news yeah. as well. Lifetime Fitness just banned channels like Fox News, what? CNN, MSNBC, and others from their TV sets to create environments that they say are, quote, here I'm quoting, free of consistently negative or politically charged content, end quote. The company says the change is consistent with its healthy way of life philosophy. Dana, is this good for you? No, I think oh, I just let people watch whatever they want to watch, especially if, if you have a machine that allows you to see just your uh, screen so that you don't have to worry about. No, what's no, up I above. think they're talking about, you know, how they have like a bank. It's almost what? like the press secretary's office. There's a bank. Yeah, I know. Of, okay. Just let people watch whatever they want to watch. But then at the A lot y, of people watch while they're doing exercise while they're watching this show, and I'm sure that's true for the other cable channels. It's a as ton well. of people who tell me. Well, what me. if you don't have a lot of extra time to catch up on the news? Well, that's true. I'm but, irritated. But you know, Kimberly, yeah. uh, some of the whys around the country had done, a, done the sim something similar earlier because people were getting into fights. People want to watch, <laughs> the, oh, no, we got to watch Fox. What do you think? Well, I mean, half the time, yeah, you'd have to tell them to, you know, put on Fox News or do this. So, I, But listen, I don't know. People should be able to watch what they want. Yeah. And, you know, I like it if people get excited and motivated and jumping around on the treadmill watching the five. Are you watching TV while you're pumping that on? I'll watch MSNBC. I'll hate watch it. You hate you know, watch it? I'll hate watch it. It, it makes me run really fast. <laughs> <laughs> Is this a true story? No. <laughs> yeah. so. What do you think? No, I mean, I just let them watch what they want. I mean, it's a safe space. The gym is creating a safe right. space. Oh. And I think people that go to the gym are, don't need safe spaces. They're healthy. They want to work out. Well, they want to get after it. I don't think the gym should like, coddle people. I think it should be a place where, you know, sweat it out. sweaty, melting little snowflakes. Yeah, melt the snowflakes. Come on, guys. Uh, 
Mr. Snowflake? Um, the biggest offender on TV, it's not politics. It's the, it's the E! Channel, which, <laughs> which basically shovels some of the most unsettling images you will ever see in your life. Whenever I'm at the gym, it's, they show this show called Botched which is pla basically electic, elective plastic cosmetic surgery gone bad. Oh. It's like watching amusement park accidents. Right before, I'm sitting there, I'm on my steer climber, I'm going, somebody turn this off. If it, the worst stuff on TV, it's not cable. No. It's this pop culture, it's the Kardashians, plastic surgery, The View. If somebody from, view. <laughs> from Planet X came down and looked at that TV, they think we are, we are, we are a bunch of vain, shallow, self-harming creatures. Whoa. Well, you mean, yeah, <laughs> maybe they have a point, huh? Well, well at my gym, it might but be But you're true. just usually writing your notes with your I'm writing my notes. I'm a stair climber writing, my, writing notes. Doing your beautiful mindset. There's a, I, I never see fights. People ask to change the channel. Can I watch this? Can I watch that? The fights are always over the machines because jerks Monopolize them. What they do is they sit on the. Go. They sit I on the. On the they, they sit on this, and they're oh and they're and they're on their phone when they're not working out. And that's what do you that's, say? That's, that's, that's what, what they, they, the they usually get thrown out what do you immediately. Say? What do you say to them? I said, "Are you like, using that?" And, then, and they go, "Yes." And they go, "You're not. You're on the phone." <laughs> And then they and then just you become the phone monitor. And then I become the phone monitor. And I <laughs> yeah, like well, you know, at least they're not smoking in the gym. One more thing. Up next. <laughs> Wait, who was Some doing are. that? Some <laughs> are. Used to. Come on. Yes. Hi, Time for one more thing. Oh, let's me. Let's do this. Hi. Greg's How to Clean Your Owl News. Ew. <laughs> All right, let's go to it. How to Clean Your Owl News. What, what you use. Oh. Uh, just get your whole handy uh, clean Windex bottle. Make sure there's just water. And just spray away. Look at that. See how easy it is? See how easy it is to clean your owl? Like, get under oh. there. Get Only under there. in Clean Your Owl News will you learn how to clean your owl. There you go. That's the helpful. underarm of the owl. I don't know what it is, but it's, <laughs> I find it. It's like, get it over here. Get it's a disturbing here. pet to have, I will admit. It's something that could rotate its head around, make means me very nervous. Only the it, can, wet. it can catch me doing things. It seems to be getting only the front side. Yes. Like, excuse me. Excuse me. Excuse me. All right, I think we've had enough of this bird. I like this all day. Yeah, that's pretty good. All right, Juan. So I'm back to frigid temperatures from my vacation in uh, Jamaica. Here we go, pictures. Yeah, I thought I'd bring you. That's what I was about to say. Oh Gregory asked for pictures. So here I am with Elise, my wife, are overlooking Port Antonio. And here's a picture. I'm looking over the world famous Blue Lagoon, which was just a ton of fun. It was like Huck Finn for me. Mm -hmm. And here's a rare picture of the family with no grandkids. That's the super moon in the background lighting up the ocean. And here are the grandkids on New Year's Eve. The hats say happy birthday because the local store didn't have any hats that say <laughs> happy that New Year's Eve. And uh, these are my kids. That's Tony, Rafi, and Ray Ray Reagan. And, uh, and here's a picture of me getting a well-deserved <laughs> nap. So Excellent. it's good to be back. Good to have you back, Wanzo. All right, Dana. Mine's just real short. Uh, I, How appropriate. Obviously. <laughs> um, I want to show you two new friends of mine. This is Lillian and Rose, and I met them at the Brick Diner in Brick, New Jersey. They're huge, believe me, huge fans of Other the five. Hand. They even made the manager change the TV to Fox News from CNN while I was there. It was a big thing. They watch every day, and I just wanted to say thanks for making new friends. Very sweet. Aww. God bless. Nice to have Very friends nice. Who have Thank hands. you for watching. All right, let's go to Kimberly. Honey, uh oh. Stop. I don't want this to start. <laughs> Kimberly's Royal News. Stop. Gosh, you're such a hater. I am. All right, so we have new royal photos that have been released today. The Duke and Duchess of Cambridge shared two adorable photos. Do you see her there? Princess Charlotte, so, so cute. As she headed off to her first day of nursery school, she's two years old. She'll be attending Wilcox Nursery School near Kensington Palace in London. <laughs> And they were taken actually by her mom. Really? Yes. So Kate now we know where she goes to school. Adorable. Great for kidnappers, Do you love Kimberly. It? <laughs> <laughs> Jeez. Wow, well, he went there. Why don't you just <laughs> Why do you put ruin... Google Maps up there? <laughs> Why do you ruin my royalty segment? <laughs> it was perfect. It Thank was that. You. you did a pretty good job, Thank I have you. to say. I'm Thank very happy. You. It's very adorable uh, royalty. A lot of them aren't as adorable. There's some hideous royalty Which out there. Which ones, Greg? Uh, let's go through the list of the ugly royalty, oh, shall we? Oh, come on. I have yes. a list right so here. Where's the list? There's Prince Charles. Not a looker, right? Not hideous. I find him quite handsome. Oh, really? No, no, no. He's, he's not a looker. He's very nice Isn't dinner it? company. <laughs> right, what do you think of Andrew? Andrew, I can't remember. She brought it up, up for a reason. Oh, uh, okay. I'm afraid. Prince Andrew, 
wait a minute, is that a dirty joke? No. <laughs> anyway, so. Jesse. Wow, I'm going to recover from Prince. this one. <laughs> All right, so this is kind of sad news, actually. Langens, this yes. Irish pub that's right across the street from Fox, is closing next Thursday. Aww. Why? Because the rent is too damn high. <laughs> They're like jacking Jimmy. up the rent big time. Everyone's very sad about this. This place really came onto the scene when Rudy cleaned up Times Square. Everyone went here. I think McCain, Meryl Streep, Baldwin, Greg Gutfeld has Waters. been there. True. Hannity. It, Hannity. We call it Studio Johnny L. Johnny Rotten. Exactly, Johnny Rotten, Sex Pistols. Uh, we called it Studio L because that was basically another studio for us. Uh, Steve Dunleavy used to go there, famous post reporter. We've had our five parties there sometimes. We've done the yeah. five. We should actually go again. We should go one last Didn't time. Didn't Jack the five have that idea us. that Greg tried to steal? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, this neighborhood's changing because, like, next door used to be a wonderful little sandwich shop. Gone. They closed all the delis, yeah. and now Langens is shutting down. Yeah. Where am I Thanks to Blasio. Yeah. 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 Blasio. Yeah. Rent's too damn high. Low, low, low crime rates. The rent goes higher for communists when you, you know it. You can't stop it, de Blasio. You're doing too good a job oh, for this please. Group. Oh, yeah. my God. Yeah. All right, yeah. shall we go? Please. Set your DVRs. Never miss an episode of The Five. Why would you? Spe